Now, I done scared half of y'all in here with that video, didn't I? Don't even lie. Like, what did we just come to this morning? Let me ask y'all a question, all right? Do y'all love our band or what? Don't they do an incredible job, worship team? Y'all so funny. On that first song, on that first song, y'all, I wanted to yell out a yee-haw or something. I, I don't know, but I'm, I'm back there, y'all. I'm moving around. I'm dancing a little bit, and everybody else doing it. Y'all could at least do a little bit, do a little bit of middle school dance. You know what y'all do? You know, a little bit of middle school, a little sway back and forth or something. Come on now. All right, we're glad that you're here this morning. Everybody doing all right? Everybody good? I'm glad that you're here. Uh, last week we started a brand new, uh, brand new series called Haunted, and we started out kind of defining what that word haunt means. And so I want to pull up that definition. We're going to look at it together real quick. Just to kind of remind us, do a little, a little refresh from last week. Haunt means it's something that is persistently in our what? It's in our minds. It controls our minds. It starts in our minds when it haunts us that can have a harmful effect on us. Now, last week we talked about fear, right? And we talked about how fear is something that falls under that category without a doubt. Fear is something that can, can haunt us if we allow it to. Fear is something that can keep us from moving forward in what God wants for our lives, to have life and life abundantly. And we read a story, which we're going to revisit today for a little bit, but we read a story in the Old Testament, Numbers chapter 13, about, about the Israelites and how the Israelites allowed fear to keep them from stepping into God's promises when it was time for them to step into God's promises. Here they were, think about it, all these years had, had passed by and they had heard about the promised land and about them coming into the land of their own, the land flowing of milk and honey, and they had finally arrived, y'all, to the edge, the edge of their promise, and all they had to do was step in and take the land. But before taking the land, the Lord told them, we'll send 12 people, 12 spies into the land, one, one from each tribe, a leader from each tribe, send them in to scout out the land. And so that's exactly what they do. They go into the land, they stay there for 40 days, and they come back and they give a report. Remember, that's what they are, basically, as investigative reporters. And so they come back and they, they give this report. And what's weird to me is even though all 12 saw the same reality, all 12 saw the same things while they were there. I don't know what's going on with the screen, but that's okay. I'm ADD squirrel. That's all I can say. But anyway, all 12, all 12 witnessed the same things, but yet they came back and you had two different, completely different reports. Only two out of the 12, Joshua and Caleb, I really like that guy, he came back, he came back, they came back and gave a good report, right? of what they saw. The land is ours, and we're strong enough. Let's go in. Let's take it. But 10 out of the 12, yes, they agreed. The land is good. They agreed that it is, it is the, the promised land. It is the land full with milk and honey. They even brought back grapes to show the rest of the group, the rest of the Israelites. Look, taste, eat. God's promises are true. But then in Numbers Chapter 13, verse 28, we see a word that changes everything. And I was going to say to say that word, but it looks like we're having te technical difficulties. So here, here's what it says. Chapter 13, verse 28. It says, but... But the, the land is good. Everything's good. Everything that God has, has promised, it's good, but this is how it reads. But the people... The people, Lord, the people that live there in the promised land, they're powerful. And the cities, they're fortified and they're very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there, and they are bad people. And isn't this many times our normal response to God? Uh, the, the grapes, God, are good. Your blessings are good. What you've shown me is good. What you've called me to do is good. But God... But God, the giants are too big. But God, the obstacles are too difficult for me to step into the promised land. See, because of fear, many of us, just like the ten, we can take, a, we can take something that's full of good news and we can quickly turn it into a bad report. Everybody say bad report. We can turn it into a bad report, man. And as I continue thinking on this passage, I don't know what it is, but for the last, I'd say, month, this passage has really been on my mind, at least three or four weeks, and, and God has just really spoke to me through this. And I, and I started thinking about it this week, and something jumped off the page at me. Does anything in Scripture ever jump off the page at you? It's like, you may have never seen it before, but it just, it just jumps off. 
See, the reason, the reason for the bad report of the ten versus the rep- good report of the two, it, it was more than just fear. There was fear there. But there was a catalyst behind the fear. There was something that was driving that fear in those ten. Something that sparked it. And it's something that I found out is way too common in all of our lives in here. And so I want to see if you can figure out on your own as we read this passage, see if it jumped out at you. Let's pray together before we jump in, though. Heavenly Father, thank you so much, God, for the opportunity to be in your house today to worship the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Almighty God. Lord, we thank you. We thank you, God, for what you have already done, for the goodness that you've shown us, for the mercy, for the love that you've shown us, and God, for the love and the mercy that continues to be poured out on us. We thank you, God. Guide us and direct us. Open our eyes to your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. So what you're doing is I want you to look for what sparked the fear in the Israelites. Now remember, the 12 saw the same reality. All of them went in. They saw the good and the bad. They walked in. They said, okay, the reality is it's good. It's all that God promised, but, but there is also another reality. There are giants in the land, and the cities are fortified. But why then were ten full of fear and two ready to go to battle? What's the underlying factor of fear? You ready to look at it? Numbers chapter 13, verse 31. I think we're up and running. 13, 31. But the men who had gone up with him said... We can't attack those people. Look at this next phrase. I want you to pay attention to this. They are, say that word with me. They are stronger. They're stronger than who? They're stronger than we are. Verse 32. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land that they explored. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. Verse 33. This is another one that I really want you to pay attention to. Look at it. We saw the Nephilim there. We what? We seemed. It's no more about facts, but it's what seemed. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. Did anybody catch it? What's the underlying factor to their fear? See, here's what's crazy. They saw all the facts, every one of them. They saw the reality. The reality is there are giants there, and those giants are strong, and the cities are fortified. Fact. But here's the thing. It was all facts until they said this. They are stronger than we are. We, We seemed... It seemed as though we're like grasshoppers in our own eyes. Let me ask you a question. What are they doing? They're assuming, but they're comparing. They are making a comparison uh, of themselves to the enemy. They're measuring themselves up to only what they can see on the outside. And here's the thing. For most of us, comparison is something that haunts us. It is something without a doubt that is persistently, and we don't always see it, but it's something that's persistent in our minds and has, can have an absolute harmful effect on us. And all of us in this room, I can, without a doubt, all of us in this room struggle to some degree with comparing ourselves or our lives to someone else's. Now, we compare about a lot of things. We compare our looks. We we compare our popularity. We compare our things, our homes, our cars. We compare that with each other. In in fact, I got myself in trouble this week. I went to pick up some things. Y'all going to see it in a little bit, maybe, for a little illustration. I went to the Dollar Tree, and I got some stuff, and I saw a nice, newer model Chevy Silverado sitting there, and I caught myself immediate. Gosh, I wish I could have that truck. Because that's nice. And I started comparing it with what I had, an older model Silverado. But we compare, and a lot of times we don't even we don't even realize it. We compare talents and abilities. Gosh, I wish I could do what they could do. Or we compare jobs, or we compare vacations, you know. They're going to Aruba, we're going to Myrtle Manor, you know, or we compare, we it's just real. We compare money. We compare money, and we compare kids. Gosh, I wish my kids would act better like those kids. They are so proper and so good. We compare our spouses. Man, if my my husband was more like that, come on, ladies, don't even act like you don't do that from time to time. And here's the thing. It's easier now to compare now than ever before because of all the social media platforms. That's where a lot of the comparison goes on. You know what else we do? We compare churches. Did y'all see what that church was doing? We ought to do that, Pastor. 
If you said that to me, I love you. I really do. But we ain't that church. And we compare churches over and over again. I'm not saying you can't learn and you can't grow. We should from each other. But we're constantly comparing ourselves to others. And again, I think we do it a lot of times without realizing it. Here's my first point. I'm just going to throw it out there, all right? Here it is. Here's the first point. I actually borrowed this from Andy Stanley. Love you, Andy. And, and, and probably he borrowed this from somebody else. But here it is, number one. With comparison, no one ever wins. On either side of the coin, when we compare, no one ever wins. Let me ask you about our story. Did the Israelites win or lose by comparing? They lost. They're stronger than we are. They didn't win. There ain't no doubt about it. We read this story, and it's hard for us to take in sometimes, but, but the truth is it says that, that a, uh, the bad report, the ones that spread the bad report, they died in a plague. That's great, isn't it? The rest had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. They didn't win by comparison. But I bet you didn't catch the other side of that verse because I didn't at first. Check it out. Let's look at verse 33 one more time. It said, we seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes. The Israelites were comparing themselves to the giants. But did you catch the second part? And we look the same to them. Not only was the Israelites comparing themselves to the giants, but do you realize the giants were comparing themselves to the Israelites? They were probably struck. Look at them. They look so cute. We're going to squash them. They're nothing to us. We can wipe them out. But let me ask you a question. If the Israelites would have listened to Joshua and Caleb... If they would have done, and they would have went in and overcome that fear, do you think the giants would have stood a chance? The answer is no. They would not have stood a chance. The bigger they are, the, the harder they fall. See, these little grasshoppers would have wiped them out because here's the fact. They had more than what was just on the outside. They had the power of God going with them, someone that was mightier and more powerful than the giants. So here's what I'm trying to say. When we compare, no one ever wins. It doesn't matter which side of the comparison you end up on. No one ever wins. When we compare, I've heard it said this way. When we compare, we're living in the land of Ur. You ever heard that? We're living in the land of Ur. Everywhere we look, we see people who are smart Ur, pretty Ur, skinny Ur, Richer, stronger, happier, got it all together, er. You just think you got it together. Those struggling with having children, everybody you see is pregnant, er. Those in school, you see people who are popular, er. And some of you single ladies, all you see is people that are married, er. Everywhere we look, we walk, and we, we walk in the land of Ur, and we can never be happy or satisfied in the land of Ur. And this is what the land of Ur does. It can make us feel lesser than we really are. But here's the thing. It goes the other way, too. We also look around, and we see people who are heavier, and let's just be honest, a little bit uglier. <laughs> That's so mean. Weaker, singler sadder, poorer, and guess what it makes us feel? A little bit greater. Now, here's a silly story. I had the opportunity to take uh, Bailey fishing a couple weeks ago, thank thankfully to Pete and Denise that allowed us to come fish. Had a wonderful time. It was her second time. She's not a big fisherman or nothing. It's her second time ever fishing. She's six years old. And I'm over there trying to be the good dad, you know, teaching her how to fish, baiting her hook for her, throwing it out there for her, you know, in the good spot. And, 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 of course, you know, teaching her if the float goes under, baby, you know, you jerk, how to set the hook. And, of course, she leaves it out there for about 10 seconds and she's reeling it in. So I go over there finally and I get my rod and I start fishing over there. And before I know it, y'all, I look over there. She is casting on her own, not on the little pink rod that we brought, but a big rod. She's casting on her own. She's hooking fish and she's reeling it in all by herself. And before it's all said and done, here's the point. She caught the most and the biggest fish of all of us out there. And we're all adults. You're talking about feeling lesser than a man at that time. My six-year-old daughter just outfished me. Now, here's what's so crazy. I, I, I caught a few fish. 
I enjoyed it. I had a good time. But it probably would have been a greater time if I would have caught more fish than my six-year-old. Just saying. Comparison keeps us constantly in the land of Ur, always wanting more. This brings us to my second point. Here it is. Number two. Comparison kills or comparison destroys a correct and healthy view, a healthy perception of ourselves. Let's look at it. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 6, verse 3. Galatians chapter 6, verse 3. It says, For if anyone considers himself to be something when he is nothing, in other words, if they think more highly than they should of themselves, he deceives himself. But each person should examine his own work. In other words, not comparing to someone else's work. And then he will have a reason for boasting in himself alone and not in respect or in comparison to someone else. For each person will have to carry his own load. Now let's go to 2 Corinthians and look at it. 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter 10 verse 12. Oh, don't worry. We wouldn't dare say that we are as wonderful as these other men who tell you how important they are. Check out this next part. But they are only comparing, there's our word, comparing themselves with each other, using themselves as the standard of measurement. And listen to what he says about this. He says, how ignorant, how stupid that you would compare and measure yourself by someone else. Because this is what happens when we compare ourselves with others. It always brings us back to one of two conclusions. We either come back feeling greater than or we come back feeling less than. And I'm going to tell you something. Neither one of those glorifies God. And this is why it doesn't glorify God is because it can lead us to a place of insecurity or it can lead us to a place of pride. Isn't it true isn't it true that the areas in our life that we feel the most insecure about are always the areas that we compare with somebody else and we see ourselves as a failure? Isn't that where we find ourselves most insecure? For example, some of us are very insecure about our bodies, right? We're, we're a little bit insecure, but I would also say there's others that are a little bit too secure about their bodies. Just think about Walmart in the summertime, need I say more? It's just true. But the reason we get so insecure about our bodies is because we're comparing to someone else's body. If everybody else's body was the same, we'd be satisfied with our bodies. If we weren't comparing, we'd be satisfied with what we, what, with what we have. Here's what I found out. If we're around what we would consider beautiful people, you've been around some beautiful people. If we're around beautiful people, then it makes us a little bit nervous. It makes us a little bit insecure. But if we look around... And the competition is low, if you know what I'm saying. If it's a little bit low and we, 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 we see that maybe we think we're the best looking one in the group, we start walking with our shoulders high. We start walking like we got a little more pride, thinking we're the king of the gym or something. But let's be painfully honest. Now, maybe I'm the only bad one up here. It may be. We sometimes delight in other people's misfortune. We do. Believe it or not, we do. We delight sometimes in other people's failures. You know why? Because in some sick way, it gives us a sense of pride thinking that we're better than they are at something. Most of us, it helps us feel a little bit better about life when we compare, when we compare the things and it seems that those things are leaning in our direction, that it's in our favor. We like being the people, we like comparing with people that we think are little competition. But here's the thing. Let me tell you something. There is no external win. And when I say external win, I mean there's, there's no I'm better at you than this or I'm better at you than that. No matter how hard we try or how good we are, there is no external win that can satisfy the internal longing of our hearts. Do you hear that? Because here's the thing, the reason we live in the land of Ur is because we're trying to satisfy an internal longing, a longing not an external one. And no matter how we try, we cannot, we cannot satisfy an internal longing only, it is only through God who created us that we can satisfy that. Comparing destroys a correct and healthy perception of ourselves, and it can lead to pride and insecurity. But here's something else I've got to throw in there. 
Not only does comparison lead to an incorrect view of ourselves, but you know what else? It also leads to an incorrect view of who God is. Because when we compare, what we're doing is this, essentially. We're saying, I want to be like that person. I like the gift that you gave that person. I want to be blessed like that person. I want to live like that person. That's essentially what we're saying. And so we are implying then that God messed up on us somewhere. We're implying then that, God, you didn't design me sufficiently and perfectly, and you're not taking care of me the way that you should. And in fact, I see this in this story with spies. I'd never really seen it before. But here it is. Let's look at it. Numbers chapter 14, verse 2. We hadn't read this one yet. Numbers 14, 2. It says, All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt. That's crazy to me. Or in this wilderness. But look at verse 3, what they did. Why is the Lord? They start blaming on the Lord. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and our children would be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to just go back to Egypt? Why is the Lord? A lot of times we start blaming our insecurities and our insufficiencies on God. The comparison of themselves to the giants caused them to doubt who God is and the promises that he had made. But I'm going to tell you something, and you need to hear this. Our insecurities and our insufficiencies are not God's insecurities and insufficiencies because he has none. Good preaching, Caleb! I mean, come on. You've got to help yourself preach just sometimes. You know, you've got to do what you've got to do. See, I got so excited, I lost my place. But this is what we do when we compare. And we all do it. When we compare, we always find deficiencies in ourselves, Don't we? When we compare, we find deficiencies. And, and, and the problem with that is, is when we find deficiencies, we always find somebody that's greater or better at something. But the problem is, then we attempt to make our deficiencies God's deficiencies. I mean, think about it. Isn't that what the ten did? They tried to make it God's deficiency. They started comparing their strength with the giants, and they found deficiencies. Well, duh, they're giants, and you're not. They said, we can't attack these people. They're stronger than we are. We are like grasshoppers. They started comparing. But the next thing you know, it it goes from we are deficient and not strong enough to the group saying, why is the Lord bringing this upon us? Why is the Lord allowing this to happen? Why didn't they just say, look, we can't attack, we're not strong enough, but the one that is with us is strong enough. And that's where we have to learn to get. Their comparison of themselves to the giants, it led to deficiencies, and those deficiencies were passed down along to their view of who God is. It was no longer, we are not strong enough, but it's that he's not strong enough. Is anyone tracking with me this morning? See, Joshua and Caleb, they realized that the enemy that they were up against were giants. They saw it, and they realized they were big, and they realized that they were strong. But here's the difference. They didn't compare their strength, their stature, with the giants. What they did is they measured up the giant's strength in comparison to the Almighty God's power and His promises. And that's what makes all the difference. See, here's the thing. I don't care what you're going through. Whatever you compare your problems or your issues or whatever giant you are facing, when it's put up in comparison to God, it will always fail in comparison. When compared to God and His power, whatever you're dealing with starts to be shrunk down into the correct perspective. Some of us in this room, we need to quit comparing ourselves to our giants. It's keeping us from what God wants Some of us have some great giants in our life right now. I know you do. Some of you are dealing with a sickness and you don't know what the outcome is going to be. Or you've you've had tests and you're waiting on the report and it's scary. It's a giant. Well, Some of us, we've got a calling on our life that we feel unqualified for. We don't even know what direction to go. Some of us have financial problems. We're in debt and it's a big giant. Maybe we have marriage problems. Boy, that's a struggle, right? It's a giant an addiction, or maybe an unshakable sin that you try to lay down, but you can't completely lay it down, or maybe a decision, just a decision that you need to make about your family. Here's the thing. Quit comparing your giants to yourself. 
Quit comparing your giants to your own strength and your own weaknesses. You will always feel like grasshoppers when you compare to a giant. Stop comparing yourself to the giant and start comparing your giants to the almighty power of Jesus Christ who dwells and lives in, in all of us who believe and follow Jesus. Because when we do that, y'all, all of a sudden the giants start to shrink. All of a sudden the problems are still there, but all of a sudden the problems start to shrink See, here's the thing. When comparison destroys a correct view of ourselves and it destroys a correct view of who God is, number three, this is what it does. Number three, comparison. Comparison distracts us from the plan that God specifically designed for our life. Comparison distracts us from the plan that God specifically designed for our life. Now, we know what happens in this story. We've already mentioned it. We've already talked about it. They end up having to wander through the wilderness for 40 years instead of just walking into the promised land. Comparison distracted them from the course that was set before them. Now, ultimately, the Israelite nation, they end up coming into the promised land 40 years later. But here's the point. They had to take an unnecessary and unpleasant detour to get there. And I think many times in our life, we have to take unpleasant, unpleasant, and unnecessary detours because we're constantly comparing and we're living in that land of Ur. I want you to look at something. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Hebrews 12, verse 1. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, we let us, uh, well, let us throw off everything that hinders. And I would say in that box of everything that hinders, I would say comparison is one we need to throw off. And the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race what? Say that next phrase with me. Marked out for us. To run the race that is marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. Here's, here's the truth. We all have a race to run. And that race has already been marked out for us is what Scripture says. And what I need you to understand, it is your race. It's not somebody else's race. Your race was designed for you. You are completely equipped, even though you don't feel like it sometimes, you are completely equipped to win your race, but you're not equipped to win someone else's. And with comparison, you know what we do? We run in the other runner's lane. What we try to do is we try to run in their race. We try to run in their lane. And when we do that, comparison distracts us from what God has for us. I want you to think about it, and I've mentioned this before. But what's the worst thing that can happen in a foot race? It's a no-no. You don't do it. You don't look to the left, and you don't look to the right, and you don't look behind you. You don't compare where everybody else is in the race. You have to stay head first, man, looking at Jesus all the way. Because if you don't, what's going to happen? You're going to end up tripping over. You're going to end up in somebody's lane, and you're going to end up face planting. Comparison distracts us away from the path that God has designed for us to take. And I, I believe that comparison is one of those things that will knock a person off a path quicker than anything else. Quit trying to be someone you were never meant to be and be the person that God created you to be. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Every one of us in this room, we've heard this passage. We've, we've heard this verse, and we're like, yeah, we love this verse. Now, I want you to take it out heart, and I want you to take it personally this morning. Let's look at it. It says, for we are God's handiwork. We are God's handiwork. He molds us. We are his workmanship, his masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus to do what? He wants us to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. He prepared way in advance. It goes right along with running the race marked out for us, doesn't it? It sounds exactly the same. We and you, all of us, are specifically and uniquely designed to follow the path that is marked out in advance for us. I'm going to try to illustrate something. This is my Dollar Tree purchase. Y'all ready? All right. And I'm going to probably royally screw this up. It's okay. Y'all see what that is? That's off-brand Play-Doh. It's still good. Anybody like playing with Play-Doh when you was young? Y'all won't admit it. Y'all like Play-Doh. I'm going to come down there with you. Might ought to cut the 
fronts off, ma'am. I got four different colors, blue and red and purple and yellow. Oh, we got it all? We good? Okay. So this is what I want us to do. I want us to picture ourselves as the blue Play-Doh. Everybody do that? We the blue Play-Doh. This is the race that's marked out for us. We are uniquely designed. We are designed to be blue. Everybody like blue? I like blue. Blue is my favorite color. Blue is great. And this is what I see happening, okay? I'm going to leave me a little bit of blue here. I'm going to give you a little bit of blue there, brother. I'm going to give you a little blue. Hang on right there, man. And let's see. Hmm. I'm going to steal some blue. And this is what I see. God has a plan marked out for us. He's got the blue flagged away. He's got it marked out. And I'm going to forget who has the blue in just a minute. But he's got it marked out for us already, and he, he designed us uniquely to be blue. And I, and I can see us, man, we're, we're following God, we're loving this. I'm going to take your blue, man. We're loving this, and we, 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 we grow. <laughs> Stress ball. We grow. God, God grows the, the passions in us, and he gives us strength, and, and he grows who we're supposed to be. We're blue. But this is what happens I see a lot of times. See, here's the thing. There's also some yellow people. And some purple people. Good grief. Come on out of there now. And some red people. And to make this quick, I'm going to give you some purple. I'm going to give you some red. And I'm going to give you some yellow. Does that sound good? Thank you. So here we are. We're meant to be blue. And we say, God, man... I see what God wants me to do. God wants me to go do this. I know this is what he wants for my life. He wants me to be here. Stand up, man. Stand up. You a big old dude. <laughs> this is what we do. God, I know this is what you called me to do. I, I, I know it. I really feel it. But God, there are giants in that land. And what we do is we start comparing. If I mess with him, he's going to whoop my butt. <laughs> and so, God, I'll tell you what, God, i tell you what. I see this yellow over here. Mm. I see this yellow, and I know I, I, I'm good at this. I can do this. I know I can do it. And what do we start doing? This is killing some of y'all. What do we start doing? We start becoming someone else that we were never created to be. And then, then we say, well, I'm okay with that. We get used to this. This is good. You know, I, I'm all right with this now. I like this new color that's being created. It's all good. Until we see red. <laughs> red just bought a brand new truck. But here's the problem, though. Red makes three times more than I make. Don't you, brother? He makes three times more. He makes three, more three times more than I make, and he bought that truck with cash. But yet, I want to go buy that same truck, and I'm going to have to put it, I'm going to have to buy it with big time interest, and it's going to destroy my family. But yet, I'm going to do it anyway, because I believe that's what I need to do. And then what happens? We mix, and we start becoming again somebody that we're not. And we're not following the path that we should be following. Who's my other blue person? I got another blue person. Oh, who? Oh, Steel. What's up, brother? So then we finally figure it out. We're like, God created me to be blue. So I'm going to go back and be blue. All right? Stand up, Steel. <laughs> See, in now I know he can whoop me too, but in comparison, keep the blue, man. In comparison, I look at that and I say, that's not worthy of me. That's not big enough. That's not, who's my purple? Who's my purple? Oh, he's right here in front of me. Why did I miss that? He's not big enough, but God, this is greater. Man, this person right here, they're making big money and, and, and life is good. And that's the life that I want. And we just keep on, man. We just keep on. We keep on with our path. And we keep, and I got way too much. This is going to be really hard to mix. And we keep on. And what ends up happening, y'all? We lose our identity. We lose who we are in Christ. We were called to be blue. Are we blue anymore? See, we start, we stop, we, we, we start losing who we are. And we stop, we, we lose our correct view of who God is. 
And then when we do that, we stop following the path that God created us to follow. And I think some of us in here, I believe that some of us are this. We don't know who we are anymore. We don't know who we are in Christ because we have compared all of our lives and we constantly feel deflated and defeated because we're constantly living in the land of Ur. I want everybody to stand with me for a moment. So I want you to hear this. God created you to be you. And there is nobody that can run your race or win your race but you. And you can't run anyone else's race and be successful in their race. If you follow God and the identity and what he's called you and created you to be, then that's where you're going to find true joy and that's where you're going to try find true happiness because you are in your wheelhouse. It is what God has called you to be. And listen, I'm going to tell you something. There are giants in the land. Everywhere God calls you to go and everything he calls you to do, we talked about it last week, there is fear. There are giants among the grapes. We have to be willing to say, God, if you said that it's going to be, I believe it's going to be. I'm not focusing. I'm not worried about my power and my strength. I'm not comparing my giants to myself. I'm comparing my giants to the almighty, all-powerful God. And so for some of us this morning, I don't know what it means. I'm not even going to give a formal call or whatever. If God has spoken to you this morning, you know that this altar is always open for you to come and let's pray together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be here to worship you. God, we pray this morning. Um, God, I realize more and more as you open my eyes that, uh, that I struggle with comparison in a lot of areas. And I've realized that a lot of times when I compare, I, I, most of the time I leave defeated. Most of the time I, I leave unworthy. I'm not good enough. I can't do it the way they do it. So therefore, I shouldn't do it. Most of the time I leave less than. But God, sometimes I'm just on the other side of that. Sometimes I, I leave prideful. Oh, I can do that better than they can. And it makes me feel greater than, and it builds pride in my life. And God, neither one of those, insecurity or pride, you, you don't want any of that in our life. But you want us to humbly depend on you. Humbly compare our giants to the almighty, all-powerful God. And so, Lord, this morning, if we're all mashed up, if we've lost our identity... God, I pray this morning that you would restore that because you make all things new. We love you. We thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.
these trials you've all Father, we thank you this morning for your truth, God, for your teaching, Lord. We thank you for your presence, God, that is with us. Father, we pray that your spirit would go with us, God. Lord, that, we would, that your word would do a work in our hearts, Father, like only you can do, Father. Your voice in our hearts changes life. Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to worship you freely, God. We thank you for the change that has happened now, today, Father, in the life of your church, God, and the life change in the future, God. We thank you in advance for what you will do in our lives. Father, we give you all the praise and glory this morning, God. Your name we honor this morning in all that we do, all that we sing, and all that we say, Father, go with us now. Send your peace and your presence with us as we leave this place, God. We'll give you all the praise and glory, and we pray in Jesus' holy, precious name. Amen. Have a great week, everyone.